Okay, good evening, everyone. I am Lauren Gates, your host of this evening's special Airway Health Solutions Conversation. It's a town hall format with our special guests and AHS faculty, Dr. Kevin Boyd, Dr. Michael Gelb, and Dr. Ben Moralia, who, in my opinion, are the goats in their field. We already agreed that we're going to forego the formal introductions. I hope that's okay with you, Kev, <laughs> because Good. we everyone can go to, um, everyone knows who you are by this point, I'm sure, and your bios are available on our website, because um, kudos to everyone who are joining us tonight. We have about 400 registrants. Not everyone can join us this evening, but I'm really excited that we have people who are so interested in airway and had so many wonderful questions that we want to try to answer everyone's questions. Um, before we do that, I would like to take a poll with those who are already logged on here just to see who's with us. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll. Um, why don't you go ahead and just tell us what profession best describes you so we can see who's joining us tonight. I know we had a lot of dentists um, from the registration that I looked at briefly, but it's nice to see what we got here. So out of 61 people right now logged on, I know it's only 8.01. I think we'll get a pretty good scope of who's with us this evening. So thank you again for your commitment to dentistry, uh, for better health, for airway health, and for overall health with your patients. So again, welcome everyone. Um, today is kind of an interesting day because something a YouTube video came out yesterday um, that we wanted to share and kind of kick off while everyone was uh, joining us today. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. And then we'll come back and discuss a very patient friendly, easy digestible video that came out yesterday that I think you're gonna be excited to share with your patients um, and parents. So um, we're gonna put that in the chat. And if you have any questions, please use the Q and A, but let me go ahead and share my screen and go ahead and play that video and then we'll all come back and discuss. Okay. Let's see, I'm gonna go full screen here. All these ancient skulls have perfectly straight teeth despite almost certainly never sporting braces. And this isn't some strange sample. According to the fossil record, ancient humans usually had straight teeth, complete with third molars or wisdom teeth. In fact, the dental dilemmas that fuel the demand for braces and wisdom teeth extractions today appear to be recent developments. So what happened? While it's nearly impossible to know for sure, mm -hmm. scientists have a hypothesis. A couple million years ago, the ancestors of modern humans lived a subsistence lifestyle. Their teeth and jaws had to work hard to make the food they ate digestible. Indeed, the surfaces of many of their teeth show extensive wear and flattening. They also had larger jaws and teeth overall. At some point, they began using tools and fire to cook and prepare food, which helped break it down. A lot more time passed, and around 12,000 years ago, some humans started farming and domesticating animals and plants. Over the course of several thousand years, it became more common for people to process and refine their food. Milling technologies helped remove the tougher parts of grains, like the germ and bran from rice and wheat. Fast forward to the Industrial Revolution, and technological innovations dramatically accelerated these processes. In a relatively short time, many human mouths were relieved of a great deal of their grinding, crushing, and pulverizing duties. And interestingly, it was around this time that tooth crookedness appears to have become more common. Examining fossils spanning millions of years of evolution, researchers have observed a gradual decrease in tooth and jaw size in humans and our ancestors. Many think that for most of human history, dietary shifts like the introduction of meat and the advent of cooking were gradual, and that changes in tooth and jaw size basically kept pace with one another. But with the more recent revolutions in agricultural and culinary habits, that relationship changed. As the theory goes, over a relatively short period, some human populations saw a decrease in jawbone size, while teeth stayed roughly the same size, meaning they're left vying for limited space. 
When they do grow in, they may displace others and get jostled into some eccentric positions. And then wisdom teeth, which are usually the last to make their debut, seem to only complicate things further. In many cases, they have little or no space to emerge. This can lead to impacted wisdom teeth, which may cause discomfort and infections if not surgically removed. So, larger jaws appear to be associated with greater chewing demands. And many scientists think that as people's diets have become less chewy, their jaws have gotten smaller, and that this has led to dental crowding, resulting in dental crookedness and impacted wisdom teeth. This hypothesis has been supported by some preliminary experimental data. In a 1983 study, researchers raised 43 squirrel monkeys on diets of either naturally tough or artificially soft food. Those fed softer food had more crowded premolars, rotated or displaced teeth, and narrower dental arches. And a 2004 study similarly observed that hyraxes raised on cooked foods experienced roughly 10% less growth in facial areas involved in chewing compared to those given raw and dried foods. In other words, the issue at large seems to be environmental or one of lifestyle instead of a genetic one, though heritable factors may be at play in some instances. It's estimated that somewhere between 30 to 60% of people today experience some level of tooth crowding. But this trend varies across global populations. Some people naturally never have wisdom teeth, and some don't experience tooth crowding or crookedness and still get their wisdom teeth without a hitch. This seems to coincide with diets that are less processed. So, how can we prevent tooth crowding early using lifestyle changes and orthodontics? Well, it's certainly something to chew over. TED-Ed is a nonprofit. Please consider supporting our... Okay, so let me turn that off. Hold <laughs> on one second. Wonderful. Let me get a full screen before I... Okay. And now I have to escape that. And I am back. Okay. So, welcome everyone. Um, Dr. Boy, Dr. Gallup, Dr. Moralia. I thought that that was a really uh, a great way to kick this off. We're really appreciative of you being here tonight, uh, volunteering your time. I know how passionate you are about airway health and sharing your wisdom. So we're very grateful. I just do want to do one quick disclaimer and then we can chat it up, I promise. Um, the following program is provided for educational informational purposes only and does not constitute providing medical advice or professional services. The information provided should not be used for diagnosing or treating a health problem or disease, and those seeking personal medical advice should consult with a licensed physician or dentist. Always seek the advice of your doctor or other qualified health providers regarding a medical or dental condition. Okay, let me let you guys speak. <laughs> so... Um, who wants to kick off about their thoughts on that video and how um, parents and patients may perceive it? I, if I could. Please. Um, one thing that jumps out at me um, is the, the term disease. And malocclusion, poorly aligned teeth and jaws, uh, according to the American Association of Orthodontists, is not a disease. It's a developmental um aberration or whatever. And I, I call that, uh, the word starts with bull. It's got an S. I know. I was afraid what you were going to say. And, and, and it's, <laughs> it's not bullseye. Okay. Okay. That it's according to Robert Coraccini, the end authority on this, who's come incredibly influenced directly me and Ben, uh, and indirectly, if not directly, Michael, he says, Malocclusion follows the same pattern of anything that could be called a chronic and non-communicable disease. It's a disease of civilization. It is a disease. So that's all I want to say. Uh, and you can quote Coraccini, and nobody will be able to shoot that down. <laughs> interesting. And it's interesting that the author of that video, just um, thanks, Gerald, for pulling that up, is G. Richard Scott, a PhD. He's an anthro um, anthropology professor. So um, there is his, there's his uh, background in the chat. 
So what do you think, Michael and Ben, about, about the video and how parents may perceive it, how the profession perceives it? Go ahead, Ben. You want me to go, Ben? Yeah, jump in there. So look, from my perspective, and I, I, I haven't talked about, never talked about this, but um, I see these, these patients coming in with these crooked, these tiny mouths, airway problems, TMJ. And the thing that amazes me, and I'd like to your opinion, they have their huge clenchers. They're trying to compensate, or maybe it's an upregulation of their sympathetic nervous system. But I, I've had these people, and they've got tiny jaws, and they've got all the problems that we treat, and they they have. And I was thinking, Ben, when you were saying muscle, I just I looked at it a different way. I'm amazed at the power of function that I see in some of these people, and I, I'm it just I think it's like. A, it's an oxymoron. It's just, it's ironic that we see that. Do you, have you guys noticed that in any of these kids or adults that you treat that they also happen to be pretty big clenchers, maybe as a compensation? Ben, what do you think? Yeah, it seems to follow. You know, I, all of my guidance on the clenching, grinding, bruxism comes from uh, Dr. Gerald Simmons. And uh, everything I kind of believe as far as clenching and grinding being related to a breathing issue and airflow, resistance, pressures, all that stuff ties into his nice research and the, the team of people that did research that he shares. And so yeah. if, you, if, you, if you get a chance to see him teach, you know, it took a few times watching him. It's, uh, he's very brilliant. <clears throat> and I didn't pick it up in the first time, but the mo when you see someone a few times, you start realizing, oh boy, he's really putting together some pieces here. So in my world, when I see someone who has any sign or symptom of clenching and grinding, they have an airway of breathing problem and it's anatomically based. And a lot of it has to do with the anatomy is too small. The air doesn't flow well, and it, it changes airflow and pressures. And it was Dr. Simmons who put together the sequence of events that poor airflow with poor pressures and compensation leads to a mechanism by which the lower jaw is moving to reposition the tongue to get the air better. So it's a protective mechanism. And, and he has a really nice research showing that he can give you the recordings of the muscle activity as the airflow resistance increases, then the muscle activity decreases as the airflow resistance decreases. And then of course, the patient who's doing all this clenching and grinding, the moment he has them titrated perfectly on a CPAP machine, they stop. All the muscle activity disappears. So I'm completely convinced that, yeah, clenching and grinding is not really habitual. It is directly related to uh, an, an airway issue. And that comes from the anatomy. So, you know, the other comment I would make about the anthropology, I know Dr. Uh, Boyd mentioned Dr. Porcini. Uh, I'm very highly influenced by him and all his work and research. And the other one I would throw out there is Dr. Jerome Rose. And I know Dr. Boyd, I know Kevin knows him very well and has spent a lot of time with him. I've had the pleasure of seeing Dr. Rose a few times visiting his clinic in, in Arkansas, but um, he, he attended a meeting that I delivered in, in Arkansas for a group of dentists there. And I was presenting anthropology research and the soft diet. And he stood right up and said, uh, almost a quote, that the early soft diet as the trigger for malocclusion is undisputed anthropology research. I know in the video, it mentions hypothesis and theory. And those are kind words to, to not be, let's say, absolute. But coming from an anthropologist in the head and neck region, like a Dr. Jerome Rose with four decades of research and world-renowned anthropology credentials, he, he stood right up and said, yeah, it's not theoretical. There are, it's not a controversy anywhere else, but in one particular segment of society, it is an undisputed fact that malocclusion comes from your environment. And like Kevin said, it's a disease of Western society and, you know, the food source. You know, incidentally, Jerry Simmons, Dr. Simmons, um, runs a course every year, and I just returned from it. And I'm thinking Ben and uh, Michael will be recruited as faculty next year. It's called the Sleep Education Consortium, SEC, 20 years. Next year is 20 years in Houston, and it's three days, and it's physicians and dentists, hundreds, uh, interacting. So mark it on your calendar. It's between, they've already got the date. Uh, it's between Easter and Passover. Uh, he just takes care of the Christians and the Jewish people. And he wants it in between those holidays. And it is unbelievable. 
Uh, anybody can sign up, SEC, Sleep Education Consortium. Google it. Lauren, I'll give you all the contact info because everyone yes. on this will be- We've been promoting that as well. We highly recommended it. We actually Great. get um, a discount to that. So we will keep everyone um, well-informed. A, a question just came up. So let's go ahead and address it. I understand that diet has impacted this, but we can't go back to being hunter and gatherers. So what do you suggest? How do we modify these growth changes? Great question. Uh, I could jump in there quick. Sure. Um, yes. So while we do try to treat the children early, we're trying to redirect the growth and development in the cause. My pathway isn't really to change the diet, so to speak, <clears throat> but there is a wonderful book out there that can help the new and or expecting or young parents. And I like to recommend it to everybody who will listen. It's called Baby Led Weaning. And Baby Led Weaning is written by uh, Jill Rackley and Tracy Marquette. And that book is in, in how to introduce your infant to solid foods. So certainly there's a pathway earlier where if we got involved with a transition from breastfeeding to hard food, we'd be better off than hard, breastfeeding to soft food. So it's the mush and the baby food and the Gerber and the softer things that are just pureed to a pulp for a year or two that really destroy the musculature and the function. So if we could transition a little better because the pathway really was in cultures that have been studied, they really do graduate from breastfeeding to harder foods. The kids aren't given a pureed mush and that seems to happen between six and nine months old according to the, the research there. So baby led weaning is a wonderful um, source of information. It's, it's not an easy pathway to tell parents you have to feed a certain way or things are the ideas that we're all, we're positioned to help out because we know the trouble's coming. Um, that, that's where I would start there. And then thank you, Mary Isaacs, for sharing um, Right Sleep by Dr. Susan Maples, who we know and love is excellent as well. So thank you for that suggestion. There was a question that relates to this bruxism and expansion. So are there any studies or perhaps you could describe any anecdotes that prove there's less, less bruxism after expansive orthodontics? I don't know. Yeah, that's that direct, I don't know question. directly. Yeah, That's yeah, a great question. Yeah, the one I'm boy. familiar with is Dr. Um, I do. I'm familiar with Dr. Simmons' teachings in that it's really about the the airflow between the pressures and the resistance in the airflow. Once he controls that, all of the muscle activity disappears. So his research is focused on uh, airflow, air resistance, air pressures, and so when you have all of the muscle activity recorded, because basically in a sleep study, he adds to the PSG. Um, intrathoracic and esophageal leads to measure airflow and pressures. And then of course he has all of the muscles attached to the leads to record activity. And that's all of the head and neck musculature. So right. what he is able to show is that with the, with the rise of airflow resistance, all of a sudden the muscle activity begins and the jaw starts to move. As the jaw is moving, the tongue is repositioned, the, the airflow resistance decreases because in positioning the tongue differently, the air can get by a little better. So as we're moving our jaw around, the airflow resistance can be decreasing, but the moment the airflow decreases, all the muscles are shut off because now you have less airflow resistance. But when the muscles shut off, you're back to a closed position where you don't have the anatomy to breathe well. So the cycle repeats itself. So he's been able to show over and over and over that it's airflow resistance leading to muscle activity, clenching, grinding to relieve the resistance, reduce it, and it stops. And this vicious cycle goes on all day and night. Yeah. So I'm not aware of just an expander you know, study to do that. I can give you, I'll give you two studies. Uh, bruxism is reduced after adenotonsillectomy. You can okay. Google that. Okay, so that's one idea. Of course, the same thing would happen with uh, expansion. And the other thing is in kids, uh, bruxism is decreased with lateral sleeping. Okay. So another, another um, observation, I treat mainly kids under six years old. And we use the pediatric sleep questionnaire pre-treatment. And we find coincidence with expansion because almost every kid we treat has a transfer skeletal deficiency. And we address that first. As Ben says, the upper jaw is the criminal, the lower jaw is the victim. When we resolve this transverse deficiency is that we see all kinds of parasomnias and bruxism. These things are associated with improvement, but can we say it's cause and effect? We can't do that, but that doesn't mean that it's not valid. Is it, we're seeing better quality of life. And so definitely bruxism coincidentally will, will resolve often 
very frequently with transverse development, but there hasn't really been a prospective study on it and there probably never will be because you can't withhold expansion from a kid uh, for a control group. You can't do that, it's unethical. So retrospectively, we look at it. And I have lots of data that shows that I widen a kid's arch that's too narrow and the bruxism goes away. Well, so does the bedwetting. And so not 100% all the time, but you give, you give parents optimism. You don't promise anything. You'll say, look, you have cause for optimism. Uh, that's what I would say. So don't yeah, worry about um, that. Yeah. The, um, Dr. Simmons um, has also an hour that he, a couple of hours that he did for us that are archived. So he can really deep dive, go to our website and look at our archived conversations. They're always free. So you can share that with all of your colleagues and refer to him to get an hour of content with, with Gerald Simmons. Go ahead, yeah, terrific. Sorry. Yeah, I would second what Kevin just said because it's anecdotal because in my private practice, it's not a research facility, but for 20 years of delivering expansive growth and development type of techniques in children, we do record, you know, the symptoms that they come in. And one of the most common ones is the clenching and grinding of the teeth because mm -hmm. it's a horrific sound. And so a three and a four-year-old can make a sound that parents can hear down the hall or on a different floor of the house. And so when you have a, a parent give you information and the top ones are like Kevin mentioned, it's there's grinding of the teeth, there's bedwetting, nightmares, night sweats, waking at night, not being able to sleep through the night. Those are very common symptoms. We go through expansive techniques, widen the jaws and allow for more tongue space, better nasal breathing. And we find those symptoms fade away. And in most kids, those disappear. Uh, so we do have the 20 years of treating children in that direction, but again, not called research. I guess that falls in the anecdotal, but it's incredibly rare not to have a symptom fade away by delivering growth and development because you're improving the air and the breathing. Oh, that's great. So could I say, Lauren, Please. that maybe the first myth, the first myth that we could bust is I hear all the time, I'm always asked the question, there's a lot of people out there that think that bruxing in children is is normal. And, and I think that's very, Ben, that's very well said, Kevin, well said, but I think that's maybe the first myth is that mm -hmm. like you shouldn't be hearing quiet, dry, still, you shouldn't be hearing your or the, your your patient should not be bruxing. They should not be clenching. They should not be grinding. Yeah, I was told in my pediatric dentistry residency that, you know what, and it was at the time of the movie E.T. Yeah. And our professor, Clem Full, used to say, um, when when parents complain about grinding, you, you should tell them congratulations that your child is not from another planet because all earthling children do it. So because it's common, it doesn't mean it's, it's good. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, common, yeah. it's average, but no, you know, so is overweight, right? It's not healthy. <laughs> yeah. And we're the, we're, we're the only mammal where the epiglottis descends at six to 12 months, right? That's mm -hmm. not no strutted eye. So there's a lot of things that do, are not in our favor as mm -hmm. mammals uh, for the airway, for sure. Yeah, and common doesn't equal normal. Like Kevin said, I like to teach that, you know, while something might be incredibly common, that doesn't make it normal. It can still be abnormal or a disease or something wrong. And bruxing is one of them. Clenching and grinding is incredibly common across all age groups, but that's not normal. And I think a lot of that originates in the medical community. And while we love our, our doctors and our medical community, there's a disconnect with the mouth. And I think in the Bruxing category, if parents are asking at the pediatrician, they're more likely to hear that that might be a normal thing and they'll outgrow it, but it's not normal. And that, that would be a good topic to pursue a little bit more than this. Yeah. Yeah. Normal in, in the realm of craniofacial and respiratory growth, normal used to mean up until industrial revolution, normal is a bell-shaped curve. They call it a normal distribution. Most of the people that are average are you know, the most area under the curve and outliers or extremes are out here. Well, normal used to mean if you weren't normal, you didn't survive childhood. If you didn't have a perfect jaw, you know, from birth to three years old, forget it, you're done. These kids, if they didn't have the foundation for a jaw that was conducive to nose breathing, you know, by the time they were two or three years old, they did not survive childhood and live to become an ancestor. And Coraccini agrees with that. And uh, Jerry Rose agrees with it. And who's the guy from NYU? Um, 
you know, Michael. Uh, yeah. Uh, he's, you know, the three yeah. major dental anthropologists, they, I, I ran it by them that, you know, a, a well-developed wide palate and forward face, if a kid didn't have it by age three, they were dead. Okay. They did not, they didn't live long enough to develop malocclusion. That's why we see no malocclusion at any age in the pre-industrial fossil record. We, in skeletal record, we don't see it because kids wouldn't live long enough to develop it. So it, it, it's a really important that you know that you don't have to tell parents that, that, you know, malocclusion used to kill kids, but well, no kid ever got malocclusion. So what does that mean? Well, because they didn't live long enough to develop it. And the all the same I'll just agree with it. Yeah. What about kids who grind their teeth while awake? Same thing. Any kid who grinds at night, they're they're clinching during the day. And that's Jerry Simmons 101. Yep. You know, it's it's a constant thing. It's just they hear it at night. You know, some yeah. parents don't hear it. That's the only reason they don't report it. Yeah, definitely. And then, the clinching and grinding is a day and night activity. You know, we think of nighttime or bruxing, but during the day, you're often clenching or grinding your teeth because the muscle activity is driven by the sympathetic nervous system. So you can't control that. So when you're, when we say, oh, you, you have sleep disorder breathing, it's kind of funny because you almost think, well, if you're breathing poorly at night when you're sleeping, that doesn't mean you're a good breather during the day. You're 24, 7, 365, a bad breather. And during the day when you're bad breathing, your sympathetic nervous system is still running. So those muscles are still firing. So of course you have daytime clenching and grinding as well because you have poor breathing thanks to the anatomy is always off. If the anatomy is always off, you have your trigger for airway resistance being there. And then of course the clenching and grinding day, night, it doesn't matter. You, you have it all the time. Normal used to mean optimal for health. Back right. pre-industrially, it, it, normal was equated with optimal for health. It's not anymore. Nope. Industry changed all that. And that's Common what- and normal really, got blurred. They, well, and they don't teach anything about this in our dental schools, in our pre-dental medical schools. It's anthropology. Ben and I have taken, and Michael, have all taken a deep dive in anthropology. It's a science that is underappreciated. And if anything people take away tonight, that's the most important thing you can get. Absolutely. Ben, I'm just going back to that study with um, proving of less bruxism. I, I recall you sharing anecdotally that people, after they were expanded and with clear aligners, then they didn't wear through their retainers. Is that something that you can apply yes. to that? Absolutely. So anecdotally, experience? I've been using clear aligners for 20 plus years now, and I don't have a single patient in the clench, brux, or TMD category that wears through a clear retainer. So when you're when we're mm -hmm. done using the clear aligners, we have delivered an expansive technique. So uh, anybody who's seen me teach in the clear aligner space over the last 18 years knows that I've only taught expansion. I've taught wider, move the teeth away from the tongue, less to no IPR. When you deliver more tongue space, and in most cases, that's all we're doing with the clear aligners is giving the tongue more room. It turns out you get to the end of treatment, you wanna give them a clear retainer to keep you know wearing to bed every night. Well, in some of the most severe clench brux or TMD patients, they wear their clear aligner to bed for retention purposes. And we now use those clear retainers for two years each at a minimum, because when they come in every six months for their recall and their check, we look at those retainers, they don't have a single mark on them. There's no cracks on them. There's no worn areas on them. And it's neat to see the progression because the same patient in the beginning of treatment, when they wear their first aligner or second aligner, when they're still in that category of poor airflow and resistance and all this clenching and grinding, in two weeks time, the first aligner can get pretty beat up. So we recognize at the beginning of treatment, you've got an aligner that shows really good wear. It's got worn areas. It might even have a crack or two. Some people can make a hole in it in a couple of weeks. Then you go through the progression. And by the time you get to the last aligner, they wear that for two weeks, it looks brand new. Then you give them the retainer. And yes, the retainer is a stronger material and it's built to last longer. But when you wear it for two years and it doesn't have a mark on it and it looks like it just came out of the package, mm -hmm. you've got a patient who is not clenching and grinding every night because that material, while it is strong, it won't survive the clenching and bruxing of, of that, that humans do. So I have a nice long history, again, anecdotally, of not really having patients wear through their retainers. And those retainers are worn for two years each now at a minimum without a single thing happening. They could wear them longer if they wanted to. They just get tired of it's old. So it right, looks right. a little, who can could, who could clean that perfectly? They're like, can I just have a new one? Like, you could have a new one every week if you want to buy new ones, but you know you should wear them longer to get your money's worth. I got a call a week ago, Wednesday night, 
uh, a 10 year old wearing clear aligners, baseball bat to the front teeth. Um, told, parents told seven hours, you know, wait at the emergency room at Lurie Children's. Found a plastic surgeon, sewed up his lip. And I said, do not take that aligner out because you're probably going to extract the teeth. Kid came in the next day. We took an x-ray before we, you know, decided what we we're going to do. And the, the lesson here is another reason to wear clear aligners, maybe earlier. Oh, my God. Endo, no problem. No root fractures, no mobility. We took that off. Those teeth were perfect. So we're going to publish it as a case study. For, you know, I'm not ever advertising clear aligners, but wow, it saved this kid uh, from a world of hurt. And it learned in the, in the adult case, uh, and Ben, I thought that was great, the explanation. You know, the daytime appliance also serves, I agree with you, the first six to eight weeks when we're setting up the case for Ben and for Kevin, it gives the patient cognitive uh, behavioral awareness during the day, lips together, teeth apart. Even before we get to you, we're trying to get them in the right position. We do that, we open the airway. So I think we're doing the same thing, but it's very, it's fascinating to see over the course of your aligners, how you're getting, as you're getting more width and as you're opening the airway, how you're getting less and less uh, parafunction. Mm -hmm. There is a question about child bruxism. Um, child bruxism, bruxism is not always an airway issue. For example, I just had a five-year-old patient, mesial step, canine class one, 20 to 30% overbite with three millimeters over jet, Breastfed until age two, no airway issues. Patient has been heard intermittently grinding at night, some evidence of grinding on lower anterior incisors, nasal breathers while watching TV during my exam, no sleep disturbed behaviors noted by parents. How can you make a blanket statement that grinding is an absolute airway issue? I would say in children, um, it ain't stress. Billy's not stressing out about who to play with on the playground tomorrow. In adults, it often is, you know, psychological stress. So the the the, the motion of a child when, when they brux and clinch, they're moving that almost like CPR, you know, bring bring that mandible forward. That kid's doing that on it's an autonomic compensation. It there's no blanket statements. Even what you or what this person said, you know, in, you know, sorry, thanks for the question, but how can you, because they're mesial step, class one, good over jet, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't mean that there isn't an undetected sleep breathing issue. We, they're just not yet detected. And, you know, what is the, what is the width? What's the depth of the palate? What is a, there's so many other things that go into diagnosing malocclusion in a child. And it, you won't come from the orthodontist. They don't want to see them till they're nine or 10. And they don't get any behavior guidance, uh, you know, uh, education during their residencies because you're not going to be seeing little kids. So good for you that, that you know as much as you do, but you don't necessarily know that that kid is cycling through four or five stages of REM sleep every night. And just because you have the mesial step, which is, you know, that tends to promote a class one occlusion, but it could be my bimaxillary retrusion. There's more to know. But you make a good point. We shouldn't make blanket statements about anything. But bruxism in kids, absolutely, you better be alert that there could be an undetected sleep problem that you don't know about. Uh, that's all. We all need yeah. to keep an open mind. <clears throat> yeah. That question. I would love to add to that. Sure. So, yeah, it has nothing to do with the mouth being open. You need nasal airflow resistance only. So you don't have to have mouth breathing or snoring or OSA to have nasal airflow resistance. So the trigger for bruxing and muscle activity is nasal airflow resistance. So you can have your lips together and still be a poor breather. There's a, there's a level where the nasal airflow resistance increases to trigger the jaw movement. And then the most important dimension or measurement or diagnostic for the child is the width. And so we need a transverse measurement. So that child, I don't know the age, if it was in there, Lauren, if it's primary no. teeth or not. Five-year-old, five-year-old. five-year-old has primary teeth. So I could describe what that child might look like. It, class one means nothing because class one, two, or three are all underdeveloped jaws. It's not about the teeth. And the classification of one, two, three is a tooth-borne or tooth position of connection in the side or profile view. 
That is not a statement about underdeveloped jaws, class one, two, or three. So in a five-year-old, that child should have a gap between every tooth. So if we think about Dr. Bogue's research and his indices, which Kevin knows very well, Dr. Bogue, who put together all this pediatric research on the primary dentition, that child should have a solid gap between every tooth. Now, what does a gap between every tooth mean? In Dr. Bogue's day, it was the width of a nickel. If a nickel could fit between every single primary tooth, that child was on track to grow all 28 teeth where they belong in a beautiful dentition and have a better than 50% chance to have their wisdom teeth come in. So that five-year-old, I would bet, because it would be a unicorn if it wasn't, I'd bet that child does not have a nickel gap between every primary tooth. Then when that child bites down, can we see the full view of the bottom teeth in a closed position? Can you see a very tiny bit of overjet and overbite where the bottom teeth are fully visible? Now we've got a gap between every tooth. We need a width between A and J, teeth A and J. The bare minimum at age four is 30 and we should be heading towards 35 by age eight. So a five-year-old should already be at 31 or 32. If you don't have 31 or 32 millimeters between A and J, you have a narrow arch. So it's about tongue space, not tooth connection. So a class one, two, or three is not an indication for jaw growth and development. That's only a sagittal plane connecting of teeth. So my bet is yes, that child does have a sleep disorder breathing condition and or an anatomically deficient airway because nasal airflow resistance is all you need to trigger the sympathetic nervous system to run the Bruxing protocol. And that Bruxing protocol from Dr. Simmons, who is uh, triple board certified in neurology, sleep medicine, and epilepsy, comes out of Stanford University over decades of research. His stuff dates back into the 80s. So it's pretty fascinating when you see the, the, the leads attached to the muscle groups and when they fire and when they stop and how it can be titrated, meaning when you apply the CPAP and you regulate the airflow and the pressure is just right, there's no muscle activity. But when you take that away, the muscle activity comes right back. So I don't know if categorizing it as a blanket statement is correct or not, but when, when I hear that a child or really any human being is bruxing their teeth, it is an airway protection mechanism. It is based on resistance of airflow through the nose, and it doesn't have to be as far as mouth breathing or snoring or anything else other than nasal airflow resistance is all it takes to trigger that mechanism. And the child described uh, has the credentials of underdeveloped jaws only because in 20 years, in looking at tens of thousands of children today, we would have to find the child that has a nickel can fit between every primary tooth, has 31 to 32 millimeters at age five between A and J, has a full view of the bottom teeth, then of course has no symptoms. Now this child having bruxism has a symptom and that symptom is related to sleep disorder breathing. The next step would be the child we're talking about, this five-year-old. I would be willing to say it's highly unlikely they develop into permanent dentition into 32 teeth. On their own. Well, whoever this clinician is, I I love her, her, his critical thinking, but they also made a blanket statement. I've got a Bruxer who doesn't have any sleep problems. Well, you just made a blanket statement. You don't know that they don't have sleep problems. <clears throat> and, and, and it's a little a too far to say sleep problem. It's really an yeah. airflow problem, air resistance, nasal airflow resistance. You know, right. that's, a, right. that's a day or night problem. It can be a day or night problem. But right. if that child has nasal airflow resistance, like you mentioned, Kevin, they're only five. The symptoms are coming. Usually that child's symptom list will build. Right now you're looking at the biggest one, Bruxing. Bruxing is enough to know you've got a sleep disorder, breathing and or daytime issue with your anatomy. So you may as well help that child. And the last thing is it's highly unlikely that child will grow into an adult that has 32 teeth where they belong. Because Well, a, Bru a Bruxer without yeah. airway problems <laughs> would be an outlier. It would not be in the normal distribution. And that should be the only thing that alerts you don't say, oh my gosh, I got a kid who has no breathing problems, but he bruxes. No, you should you should really think, oh, maybe there's something I'm not seeing here. That's all. We're not criticizing yeah. you. And we're, we're trying to encourage better screening yeah. because uh, to say class one, that the bite is not the issue. It's the jaw development. You can be class one and malocluded all the time. In fact, most class ones are malocluded because what class one bite comes in with the teeth properly positioned and will grow to 32 teeth where they belong. Outside of that, you have a malocclusion on your hands. So class one, resetting the class one, two, three, by the way, class one is not an indication of healthy. And class two and three aren't really indication that you have a disease. The idea is you have a class one or two or three, they can all be unhealthy, which most of them are. And it's just a position where the teeth touch each other. So it's not necessarily a diagnostic 
for your sleeping or your breathing. So class one doesn't mean there's no breathing issue. And it certainly doesn't mean your jaws are fully grown because you can be class one malocluded with underdeveloped jaws. And it's more important to measure the width because that's where you get your tongue space from. So we would like to know about that five-year-old. Do we have a gap between every tooth? Do we have more than 31 millimeters between A and J? Now you're heading in a direction to start to see, well, maybe there is an issue. And then the good news is that you could help that child now because the more important issue isn't proving a point. The more important issue is that five-year-old needs help because bruxing the teeth now is an indication that you're not breathing well and it'll only get worse. These conditions that we talk about escalate over time. They don't decrease. So, you know, the, there is a pathway to OSA and that child's on it because once you have some symptoms and you head down that road, they tend to get worse over time because it's, it's a chronic deterioration we're talking about and it's an inflammatory response going on so you tend to get worse over time, not better. No one's going to outgrow their malocclusion and no one's going to outgrow their symptoms and improve or spontaneously heal. So we're really here to encourage treatment for that child because when you hear a five-year-old is clenching and grinding their teeth, they have at minimum nasal airflow resistance. If I just could, clarify, Ken, you just please. said nobody outgrows a malocclusion. If you see malocclusion, at two, three, four years old, 100%, it will not ever, it is incapable of self-correcting and it will always worsen. So I'm glad you brought that up, Ben. People don't know that and orthodontists don't learn that or they say, okay, so what? We can treat it later. It will persist. Some of them know it, some of them don't, but nobody wants to do anything about it. When you say what you, what you should be, when you should be able to see all the lower teeth, are you talking about the vertical? Yeah, like in the bite. In other words, uh, when, a, when a child bites down, like, like if we were talking about um, that Bogue index and Bogue's kind of research and what looks, what's a normal four or five year old, you would need a gap the size of a nickel between every primary tooth. When in, the in the front, down, anterior, not every back tooth though, just from okay. canine to canine. But at least a space between those molars. In other words, there should be still a space between them. Not you the should nickel. be able to probe them directly. You, be able you to, don't yeah. do bite wings. Yeah, that, that's true. But then not you a need, nickel. You don't put a nickel between the back teeth. Well, no one should put a nickel in the mouth. I'm just saying that. Yeah. Dr. Bogue's <laughs> research is 120 years ago. So we're talking about, yeah. you know, from 120 to 100 years ago, his research is a time where they could take a nickel and touch the teeth. We wouldn't do that today. Yeah. But just to give you a framework for the width, it's the widest coin. Then the bite is that when you do bite down, there's a very shallow overbite or overjet. You have a view of the bottom teeth. So we want to see a, we want to see the bottom teeth upon biting. And the most important index is the width, meaning Dr. Bogue had this beautiful transverse measurement research going on in children to show they need to be at 30 millimeters at age four in order to progress towards a normal and well occluded set of teeth by the time they're 12. And to have even a fraction of a chance of the wisdom teeth coming in 30 millimeters at four, 31 or two by five is really appropriate. I would doubt that child's 32 millimeters at five years old. So well, we've got the industrial skulls where they're 34 by age six. I mean, it's mm -hmm. they're almost their full adult width before they're eight years old in the pre-industrial skeletal record. So, yeah. you know, it's amazing. Uh, I'm so glad you're doing this, Ben. I mean, Dr. <laughs> Bogue, nobody oh. knows him. <laughs> Are you kidding? Well, I'm now they do. You. Now they do. I'm He's following you. <laughs> I'm following Full circle you. here. Full circle. What a mentor. <laughs> a follow-up question to this. So in pediatric patients with bruxism and clinically have signs of deficient cranial facial growth, is it necessary to send them to a sleep study prior to treatment? My, my answer, quick, you don't send for sleep studies in kids. You call the pediatrician and you inform the pediatrician. And you and the pediatrician decide together, does this kid need to see an ENT first? Don't do it yourself. You don't have to. And another advantage of contacting the primary care physician, usually a pediatrician in kids, you let them know you do more than fill cavities. What's this guy, what's this dentist calling me about adenoids for? So that would be my first. And, and you, you know, let the ENT and the pediatrician collaborate with you do you need to refer for a sleep study? Often you can solve the problem before they need a sleep study. So that's my take on it. <clears throat> yeah, same. We don't sleep okay. with the children. They're unreliable at best. They don't sleep well in the clinic, but we're not treating the sleep diagnosis anyway. So we're not treating OSA. We're not treating snoring. I'm not treating the clenching or the grinding. Those are the symptom list that's downstream right. from underdeveloped anatomy. I'm treating in my lane. I'm diagnosing underdeveloped jaws or malocclusion and treating that because Period. that's what I'm trained to treat. So I make my diagnosis 
And you can make that diagnosis at three. Kevin can make it at two because he knows even younger with his training that at one and two years old, he could recognize right away that child is underdeveloped and will have every bit of it. I tend to start at age three, but that's okay. The earlier, the better, number one. Number two, everything we do is diagnostic in the malocclusion category for underdeveloped jaws. And then when you treat that to proper positioning, you'd start to notice that the symptoms fade away. Mm -hmm. But collaboration is right. That's a good thing. You talk to the pediatrician, you can talk to the ENT. The more you collaborate, the better, because then the message gets out, the word gets out, and they'll be looking for you to help more of the children that way. So the word of the evening is bruxism, it seems like. What role does anxiety truly play in the cause of bruxism, if at all, or is it a result of poor sleep, unhealthy airway? Where does anxiety play? It's anxiety producing to the parents. It's just like night terrors. Why do they call them night terrors? Because it terrorizes the parents. The kid's not terrified. They don't even remember it. And no, you know, it's not a stress response. It's an airway response. Yeah. And I'd say if you look at Abram Gold's work with the functional somatic syndromes, a lot of my patients with anxiety, panic attacks, depression, I'd say I can make that typically 50% better in about two weeks once I open up the airway. So I, I'd like to look at those things as labels. People have mislabeled oppositional defined disorder, ADHD. Steve Sheldon said it, Kevin, 10 years ago, that 50% of those patients don't really have ADHD. So I'd say you have to look carefully at anxiety. If you look at the definition of a general anxiety disorder, it sounds like a sleep disorder. So you might as well, I used to say this with Christy, even with kids on the spectrum, get rid of the airway issue first, give them a good or organic diet, let them play outside, get exercise, and then see what kind of kid you have left. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you that you're going to improve anxiety. You're going to improve a lot of these parasomnias. A lot of things that we're talking about are going to get better after a couple of months of treatment, and they're just going to seem to disappear. How can we communicate to the parent who complains of grinding in child yet says they sleep well? What can we document? What are the next steps? They sleep long. They have cue in sleep is quantity and quality. But because a child sleeps long, parents equate that usually with, oh, he's a good sleeper. But that's what should trigger the questions. You know, and I call it Dairy Queen Sunday, dry, quiet, and still. Children should be dry. They shouldn't drool. They shouldn't sweat. They shouldn't be thirsty. They shouldn't get up to go to the bathroom or stay in their bed and go to the bathroom. They should be quiet. You shouldn't hear them snore. You shouldn't hear them grind. You shouldn't hear them headbang. You shouldn't hear them talk in their sleep. And they should be still. Their bed shouldn't look like a soccer game was played in it. And, you know, they you shouldn't hear them falling out of bed or getting out of bed. You know, dry, quiet, and still. If you don't have time to go through the 26 questions on the pediatric sleep questionnaire, just say every one of them relates to their your child should be dry, quiet, and still, you know. Uh, that really has helped a lot of people already. Great. Thank you. Great. Okay. Yeah. Great topic on bruxism. Uh, next question. Do upper night guards close the airway? Let's have uh, Dr. Gelb address that one. 90% of patients that come into me for TMD have an upper night guard that was made in retruded condylar position, terminal hand, centric relation. I think what we were teaching 40, 50, 60 years ago, I see a lot of adults. It's what I see coming in. And the studies would lead you to believe that uh, these retrusive positions are, are, are most likely, it shows that the apnea and the snoring is increasing by 50%. So Nicopolu, Gagnon, uh, if you look at the American College of Prosthodontists, they're recommending that you get a sleep test, a sleep study in adults before fabricating a guard, and that you don't fabricate a guard without some degree of protrusion in the device. Okay. Yep. There was another question in the chat. Do you think that improved 3D jaw developments could also be a factor in better jaw alignments, and this could also help reduce bruxism and TMJ issues? I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, yeah, it's in the chat. So I don't know, improved 3D jaw developments. I don't know what that refers to. Maybe, maybe um, Dr. McCoy, maybe imaging. you could clarify uh, in another. Um, all changes are three-dimensional. 
we may okay. have yeah. on transverse, but it's going to affect vertical and sagittal too. Okay. So yeah, I don't know what they mean by that. Okay. Sometimes we um, lose the expansion, but like Kevin said, just to say that one more time, it's the transverse development, the expansive development gives you both a correction sagittally and vertically. So that's the one category where you can influence the other two. Whereas the other two categories, addressing them only doesn't improve the transverse. So you should go after the one that triggers the others downstream kind of thing. So it's, it is a 3D improvement, really. So the follow-up question is, will transverse maxillary growth stimulate AP growth? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that is in every case I've ever treated for 20 years. When you have wider developing, you have an AP change. And it doesn't come anecdotally. Dr. McNamara out of the University of Michigan showed that very nicely about A point. Uh, a point travels forward with lateral expansion only. And so with lateral expansion only, you do get a forward movement of A point, number one. Number two, with lateral expansion, the upper expansion delivers a release of the lower jaw because most people are trapped back thanks to the underdeveloped upper jaw. So if the upper jaw is too small and your lower jaw is trapped under it, we work like a shoebox for class one and two type bites. Dr. McNamara showed that, yes, you can have that correction of the AP change from the lateral expansion, both A point coming forward, as well as the lower jaw releasing. Yeah, McNamara also, um, who's a hero, along with Cortini with me and Ben, is that B point is, is what he calls spontaneous class two correction, but that's where the myofunctional therapist comes in. If the upper jaw is wide enough, in you know wider than the retruded lower jaw the lower jaw can be with a myofunctional therapist bring it forward it feels better to interdigitate forward but the kid has to, sometimes they'll do it spontaneously but a myofunctional therapist can teach this child after we've gotten transverse optimization in a class two kid the lower jaw will feel better if it comes forward and fits and it acts like a functional appliance major major stuff in McNamara is not even aware of how much good he has done. His stuff's 20, 30 years old. And, you know, it's just not being taught in orthodontic programs. But you and I obviously have capitalized on it uh, and the kids have benefited from it. Such a thing as overexpansion in children. I understand there is a minimum width for a particular age. But if, say, the child at five has a transverse of 30, Six millimeters, excuse me, six millimeters deficient sagittal would expanding to 36, 38 be too much? Yeah, if, if I could jump in on that, because I just did a unit on this with Jerry Simmons group, is that a kid who has transverse skeletal deficiency without a crossbite, did you hear me? You do not need a posterior crossbite to diagnose maxillary skeletal deficient transverse deficiency the first thing we do all right the alveolus is inward and the teeth are inward and it gives the optical illusion that there's a deep palate that the palate is going up into the nasal cavity guess what it's not hardly ever it's an optical illusion the first thing we do is we upright we unwarp the alveolus where the teeth go, you know, the roots go into alveolar bone. We upright that. And then we upright the lingual verted teeth. And then simultaneously, we expand against the mid palatal suture until the maxillary tuberosity bumps into the zygomatic buttress. All right, then you get, so you get three things happening. You get uprighting, unwarping of the alveolus, the curve of Wilson changes, right? And then also uprighting of the tilted posterior teeth and you get the roots under the crowns and the expansion happens across the mid palatal suture until it runs into the zygomatic buttress, then you can't do it anymore. So there's, you can tip teeth out of bone, but if you learn how to do this the right way and time it, you're not gonna do that. You may get some overexpansion and, and tipping of teeth. Just stop what you're doing and it'll go back. We teach you that stuff. Now, people will criticize you. You can't expand the mandible. And the first thing you should say to them, you are right. You can't suturally expand the mandible because there's no suture there. But you can upright the alveolus. You can upright the teeth in the alveolus, change the curve, flatten the curve of Wilson, and you've got 
unwarping of the alveolus, you've got mandibular development. It's not true sutural expansion. People are, so tell people they're right. You can't do that suturally because there's no suture. That's, I've learned this. Oh my gosh, the criticism that I was getting when I started, you know, developing mandibles to match my maxillas. And I just learned how to talk to people. That's all. Don't get mad. It's their curriculum. Don't get mad at orthodontists. It's not their fault. It's their curriculum. They get no pediatric behavior guidance training because it's implied you're not supposed to treat them early. They're wrong. The word starts with bull. It's got an S in the middle and it's not bullseye. <laughs> so we were asked this question about a hundred times is what is the right age that we should start ortho in children? Whatever you're capable and comfortable with. If you're comfortable with a three and four year old, they're biologically eligible. If you can over overcome cultural obstacles, dad says, no, I didn't get braces until I was 13. Boyd's not an orthodontist. He's a pediatric dentist. I want a real orthodontist. Those are cultural obstacles. We don't have orthodontic insurance. Um, you're too far away. You must assess and overcome cultural obstacles. But biologically, a kid is eligible as soon as it's recognized. And usually when there's 20 teeth, right, Ben? Like two and a half. Oh, three? yeah. Oh, yeah. In, in my world, it's age three. You can recognize and diagnose underdeveloped jaws. You have the malocclusion diagnosed at three. That means you begin treating at three. In your world, you can handle a child between two and three. I, I'm three to four where I can handle them pretty well. But I know in your world, you can do this at two to three years old because you're totally capable of handling the child. So the idea is that the child is ready for treatment the moment you make the diagnosis. Because and it isn't just me, it's my team. I got a lot of people that help yeah. me. You, that's right. You got to put a team together that's willing to treat the child early because the moment you make the diagnosis, you know, you can start to put that child on a path to oral health, which will lead to the overall health. And really the goal is ultimately we want that child to have 32 teeth. The, the outside development chance would be to increase your opportunity to have 32 teeth develop. And you do want all of the teeth where they belong because that makes the entire system complete. And when you have the whole, all of the parts to all of the system makes it run perfectly. So you need all the parts where they belong to run that system beautifully. And then you translate into a healthy human being and your chance to get those wisdom teeth to come in by themselves really means addressing the malocclusion early as possible. So the younger you meet the child, the better. And then to piggyback on the mandible thing, uh, we didn't get a lot of time to throw, I know you brought it up, the myofunctional therapist, but that's a big help. And since the tongue's responsibility is mainly to grow the jaws when it's functioning and strengthened appropriately, don't discount the tongue's ability to grow that mandible for you when you recruit it. So we get the frenum revisions done and the myofunctional therapist involved because while we do use plenty of lower expanders and those who learn from me know if you're putting an upper expander in a child, they're getting a lower expander because the amount that we're going to travel to get to 32 teeth one day is significant. We can't do upper only. We want both. But immediately we get to the myofunctional therapist for the frenum revisions and the tongue work, because when you get the tongue on your side, guess who grows? Both jaws. It's how it used to happen with the early hard diet and the tongue function driving the jaw growth and development. So recruit the myofunctional therapy teams in your communities to work on these kids earlier, the better, because that's when the tongue would be growing the jaw. You may as well get that jaw growing naturally. And why not recruit the tongue to help you than to try to fight it with a whole bunch of rubber bands and all kinds of other stuff? When mm -hmm. you can't really battle the tongue that well and things don't work well that way late, get it early. Myofunctional therapy, big help. I, I would say two advantages of early treatment that I didn't know about till I started working with you, Ben and Lauren and Michael, is that um, when you treat effectively early, you make the kid eligible for very, you know, I'll call it easy, uncomplex treatment with clear aligners when they're ready for phase two and when they get to Michael, as adults, he's not having to put out forest fires, but maybe just smoldering ashes, is that, you know, he's treating the problems that Ben and I haven't, you know, intercepted early. And he may have a train wreck, or he may just have a little fender bender, uh, and uh, or not at all. Maybe they never reach him. They don't need him. I don't think they do. Yeah. No. 
Well, we're on top of the hour right now. I'm not going to take the time to review upcoming events. Uh, we're going to send that up in the email, but I do want to point out that on our website, all of these courses from the faculty are listed on our website in great detail. If you want to learn the techniques from how they've done these treatments, uh, incorporating airway, um, please learn from these amazing um, professionals who are sharing their time and their passion, and they really do a great job helping you integrate this into your practice. Uh, we are having our Airway Palooza in March uh, 2024. That's March 15th and 16th. We're going to launch that publicly on Cinco de Mayo. I thought it was appropriate for we're celebrating airway dentistry and implementation. And um, check out the mentoring services that we have. We're here to help you. And that's why we call ourselves Airway Health Solutions so we can help you on your journey. Thank you all for your interest. For our existing airway dentists, um, we are gonna jump over to our private uh, town hall, which we run quarterly free of charge. So once you sign up for one of our courses, you become part of our family and we have a more casual chat and um, even some case reviews. So um, that's another perk of being um, an airway dentist with Airway Health Solutions. I can't thank you all enough. This has been a really wonderful session. It kind of focused on bruxism, but it's such a hot topic that I'm glad we covered something deeply. And it seems like we need to have more of these. We're also, we're also going to do master classes on myth busting. So stay tuned for more free information from Airway Health Solutions and this amazing faculty. Thank you all. And we'll see our alumni over at our other meeting. You have to join separately. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thanks for coming.